than television and the royal media services by extension. Nam, hujambo mtazamaji, shukran sana kwa kujiunga nasi. Naitwa Nancy Okware kutoka kwenye shirika la utangazaji humu nchini KBC. Good evening. My name is Jesse Rogers representing KTN News and by extension Standard Group PLC. Jina langu ni Duncan Haemba kutoka NTV shirika la Nation Media Group. And my name is Givas Maina from K24 and by extension MediaMax Limited. Good evening. My name is Eric Monene from Cape Media comprising of TV47 and Radio 47. Thank you yourself for joining us for this broadcast coming to you live as I've said from the private residence of the Deputy President Rigathi Gashagwa. Thank you for having us Mr. Deputy President. Let's begin on our key thematic area number 1 which is on press freedom and the independence of the media in the country. Does the Kenya Kwanza administration understand and appreciate the role of the media in a democracy? Thank you very much. Let me also follow suit and introduce myself the way you have done I'm Rigathi Gashagwa uh, Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya As an African elder I cannot start speaking before welcoming you to my home Welcome to my private residence Thank you I've lived here for the last 24 years I'm sorry my wife is not here she is out of the country but I will try to make you feel comfortable <clears throat> within my ability Okay thank you The Ruto administration believes in all freedoms as per our constitution including the freedom of the press the fact that six media stations are here is a clear testimony of my faith in the freedom of the press that's why you are here if we do not believe in freedom of the press i will not grant this interview the media plays a critical role in informing and educating the people of Kenya the free media is a good thing for this country in the 80s we only had kbc and the voice of kenya then and government would chat on the information the way it wants but with a liberal media it's good for the country people have choice you cannot cheat the people of kenya more anymore if one station is biased they just switch and go to the next one press freedom is important and a critical component of our democracy and president ruto and i are beneficiaries of a free media and our democracy is strengthened when we strengthen press freedom but as much as we have freedom of the press it goes with responsibility you have a responsibility as a media to be objective and to be accurate and i request the media also to be fair just like you are free to criticize the government and to criticize anything under the sun you too must allow people to criticize you affirm you where you do well encourage you when you perform well and point out where you are failing when you are not objective we we'll tell you you are not objective and it's our right we don't have to be right by the way it's our view if i find a certain media station is not objective i'll say so in broad daylight if you find the deputy president is out of order you also say so but let us not have rules for one group okay and not for another you also must allow us as leaders of this country as kenyans also to hold you to account as you enjoy the media freedom that is enshrined in the constitution your excellency article 131 of the constitution section 2 subsection e says the president shall ensure the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms and rule of law now article 34 of the constitution is explicit on freedom of the media which means it is guaranteed under the rights and fundamental freedoms that is non negotiable uh. now when you talk of that assurance when you took oath of office on 13th of September yes protecting and upholding the constitution is key among them yes 
you are under the presidency you are tasked to protect the freedom of the media because it's under the non-negotiable rights yes. rights and fundamentals yes you were in moranga recently yes and uh, you spoke clearly yes. that uh, the media attempted to cross your path you hammered them nine nil in your own words yes and said atapa mbele tumwangoja mutaona uh -huh. less than 48 hours senate majority leader and Kericho Senator Aaron Cheriot uh, took to his social media uh, and singled out two sectors, the media and the banks. Yes. And he said there has, a way has to be found to crush them. Uh, what does that speak when it comes to freedom of the media? What is the agenda of this administration as far as the uh, media freedom is concerned? Absolutely. I repeat what I said in Moranga. We hammered the media 9 nil because media was part of Azimio. And we hammered Azimio and all his affiliates, including the media. That's what I meant. And in another election, if the media is in bed with our opponents, we'll crush them, politically speaking. You remember, the media sponsored headlines against President William Ruto. The media ran fake opinion polls, which were discounted on the ballot. The media had false narratives against the candidature of William Ruto and I. As late of last week, the standard media, against all known journalistic ethics, ran a headline that Gashagwa and his wife had asked for 1.5 billion. All the other newspapers reported correctly. They went ahead to say that Gashagwa had demanded for 1.5 billion, which was untrue. Gashagwa does not demand for any money. The office of the deputy president is a public office that is supposed to be funded from the public. Gachagua, the deputy president, has a spouse, not a wife. It was a very biased piece of journalism. They went ahead to say that Gachagua demanded. The minister, former minister, had said they had requested on behalf of the deputy president and his office. There is nowhere he talked of a demand. But the standard newspaper that has been very biased against our administration went ahead to write lies to the people of Kenya. And we are saying, much as we respect the freedom of the press, when you go haywire, when you degenerate into gutter press and yellow journalism, we'll call you out. Just as we respect your right to call us out. Mm -hmm. So it's a mutual relationship. And the media cannot arrogate itself the moral high ground that it can criticize others but cannot be criticized where they go wrong. You, the media, carried fake opinion polls. The people of Kenya on the 9th of August put you to shame. And we kept on saying these are sponsored polls. And we called you out. We saw owners of media stations on top of a lorry, a media owner campaigning for Azimio. That is not objectivity. We had to call them out. So if you want respect, it's mutual. Be objective, observe the code of ethics, and don't be biased. Be objective. So what Senator Aaron Cheriot said is that among the people okay. we are looking at is the media because the way they are behaving is not right. I have seen new people, the media. When we had the previous administration and prices of food were high, you never wrote a story. Today, even when those prices have gone down, it's a headline every day. You are not objective, and that is the truth. Okay. No, and we shall you continue. Are. We shall continue every day. I would have been concerned if any journalist had been harmed by anybody. If you had come to this home and you are locked out, you have not been locked out. You cover the president, you cover myself, you cover all our ministers, and nobody has stopped you. But you cannot gag us from giving an opinion of what we think is your performance. Okay. That no, is our right as Kenyans. Much as the media freedom is enshrined in the Constitution, our freedom of speech equally 
is guaranteed by the very constitution. There was a journalist who was attacked in Muranga at the uh, uh, your, your spouse's event. You've said you've not heard. There's a, there's a journalist uh, under National Media Group who was attacked in Muranga. That journalist who had a scaffold with the security personnel attacked to the spouse of the deputy president has had four other scaffolds with the security personnel along the way. That journalist comes to meetings drunk all the time. And what will happen is the security people have to do their work. If you come, you are drunk and disorderly in a meeting. Even if you are a journalist, you are not above the law. And that is not the first situation. That was the fourth. He had three other uh, incidences with uh, former deputy president, now president, William Ruto. Okay. And it is his habit. Every time there is a meeting in Moraga, he turns up drunk, becomes unruly, and the security personnel, just as the media have a job, a job to do, okay. they also have a job to do to protect the person they have been assigned to protect. Thank you. Now, Mweshimu wa Naibu wa Rais, tukisalia tu kwenye ilo swala kusiana na uhuru wa vyombo vya habari. Unahisi ya kwamba maneno ambayo anatumika na wale viongozi ambao wanasema ya kwamba wanahabari pengine wanakasoro fulani ni maneno ambayo anafaa. Kwa mfano, unapotumia maneno kama cartels ama yo kukrash. Unaona ya kwamba pengine mnastahili kutumia njia gani angalau kupeleka malalamishi kwa wale ambao wanastahili? We'll continue talking about cartels. We know some of the cartels even old media stations. That we know. So it is absolutely correct when the media stations try to protect the cartels because two media stations are owned by the very cartels we are fighting. And we are going to fight these cartels because we have a responsibility as leaders of this country to make sure that we protect the farmers from exploitation. Okay. We make sure we protect consumers from exploitation by cartels who have been perpetuated by state capture and conflict of interest. So we know that uh, two media <coughs> stations are owned by the very cartels we have a problem with. Okay, but m m Deputy President, Excellency Kashagua, you are in position of power as the second senior most employee and that mandate you enjoy from the people. Have you lodged complaint as per the laid down procedures, for, for example, in institutions within the media framework. I mean, you still, there is vagueness about people you want to name, you are saying issues of cartels, but have you followed the right procedures and channels as laid down in law? I am a leader in this country. One of my duties is to comment publicly about the issues that I think I need to comment on. I have no faith in that mechanism because that mechanism that regulates the conduct of the media watched as the media went wrong, as the media became biased against William Ruto and I, and they never uh, raised a finger. So asking us to go and complain to the media council is a waste of time, because when the media went against us, you know, bare knuckles, headline after headline, calling us thieves without evidence, calling us all sorts of names without evidence, we did not complain because it would have been a useless venture to complain. All we do ourselves are answerable to the people of Kenya, and our bosses are the people of Kenya. So what happens when we find something that we don't think is right? We tell the people of Kenya and we leave it at that. Thank you. Unfortunately, and that is the rule of law. So are you saying you will disregard the rule of law because the rule of law says if there are issues, you follow the channel and raise with the media? Once, once we raise the issues to the public, we consider the matter as good as prosecuted. In fact, we have done well. That is why you are raising the issues, which means our concerns have, have, have started being addressed. You decide what to do. You may have a matter with somebody, and you may decide just to talk to that person and not pursue him in court. In matters, media, bias, we will raise it with the people of Kenya. When we find you have gone out of the way, we will raise it with the people of Kenya. And I want to call out the standard newspaper. They owe the office of the deputy president an apology. And I would like to explain. Regarding Ashagwa, as deputy president has not requested for any money to his office, what you must know, and I want to take some bit of time to explain to you, is that Yukuro Yatani, the former CS National Treasury, in conjunction with Kenodhi Abogwa, the then controller of State House, who was the accounting officer for both, the office, for both State House and the office of the deputy president, mm -hmm. under the direction of President Uhuru Kenyatta, cut all funds to the office of the deputy president. For four years, President William Ruto, then deputy president, fueled GK cars from his own pocket. For four years, 
he bought tea for his office. For four years, he paid electricity bills for his office. For four years, he paid allowances to staff accompanying him across the country. And when he became the president-elect, these two officers who were attending meetings in his office were embarrassed. And they sought to undo the damage of what they had done to save their face. Previously, the, fall, the previous year, the budget of the office of the deputy president was 4 billion shillings. They went and ha ahead and cut 1.5 billion shillings. That is what they were trying to reinstate. And the deputy president regarding Ashagu had nothing to do with it. That is their work. So when the standard newspaper was trying to assist the attorney to divert attention from the real issues, the real issue was that in the dying hours okay. of the Uhuru administration, President Uhuru Kenyatta pushed the control of budget through Yatani, and it's documented through WhatsApp messages, to pay 15 billion shillings in 26 minutes, money that we shall give you details of how it was stolen. And the standard newspaper was trying to divert attention by letting the people digress from the theft of 15 billion shillings in 26 minutes, in the dying hours of the Uhuru administration, by trying to say that the deputy president had requested 1.5 billion shillings. Even if he had requested, he had not stolen the money. Okay. A request is just a request. But in this matter, no request was made from my office. It is the control of State House who made a request, and they were trying to undo the damage they had done to President William Ruto to save their face. Mm. So I would like to say, when such issues happen, we shall call you out because we expect the media also to be responsible. Okay. And we expect the media to know the elections are over. Okay. Assume you're lost. We know you went to bed with them. Can you stop living in denial and get back to work and work professionally and objectively and report to the people of Kenya the happenings as they unfold? Okay. Your Excellency, um, Section 27 of the Media Council Act, I want to go back there. Section 27 of the Media Council Act establishes a Media Complaints Commission. Um, one of the main mandates of that commission is to handle complaints from the public. You've uh, clearly stated that you are not going uh, to seek redress through uh, you know, such mechanisms. Uh, does that mean that now we have two sets of rules, one for the common monanchi and then others for the no, deputy president? Absolutely no. You have a choice whether to complain or not. Even in normal times, there is somebody who can abuse you. And you decide to live with it. You don't have to report because there is a law against uh, abuses. It's your choice. In our cases, we are leaders. Once we have let the people of Kenya know that the standard is biased, we leave it there. It is the people to judge. And the fact that you guys now are feeling it is very good for us. It's very good for our democracy because we are having this discussion. You expect to be biased, to be subjective, but you don't want to be questioned by anybody. Yet, every day you hold us to account. You hold everybody to account. You don't have that preserve. That is only you who can hold others to account. The media too must be held to account. And we'll call you out okay. when you become biased, when you are not objective. We have a right okay. as leaders, as a country, as a people, equally to call you out. Okay. Excellency, before we move to the next uh, itemized uh, agenda, which is on governance, one final question on this. We are a democracy, and you have stated that. You have the right to be offended and the right not to be offended in democracy because we are uh, a secular society. And uh, the media professionals have largely adhered to the court of principle and ethics, which is objectivity and the right to fair coverage for all the parties. You have talked about crushing in terms of political. You have said you will not complain as per the laid out procedure and that you will complain to the people. The people voted for the constitution which provides for that avenue. We are still hanging, there is something loose about it. Are you assuring the Kenyan people that the freedom of media in Kenya is here to stay for this administration? The freedom of media is here to stay, but you are saying that you have done objective and fair coverage. That is a lie. During the last election, in Citizen News, they would give Raira Odinga 20 minutes and give President William Ruto 3 minutes. We complained, we stopped complaining because nothing was being done about it. Raira Odinga was being given free live coverage. Five days 
before the election. On Saturday, I think the sick, I approached Inoro, uh, uh, Inoro Station. They, I said I want to buy live coverage. They charged me 4.6 million. I said I'll pay. On the last day, they said, no, we can't give you live coverage. Okay. Keep your money. Thank you. And I was paying for the space. Because Uhuru Kenyatta knew that if I had two hours on the Noro TV, five days before the election, I would talk to the Kikuyu Nation. Thank you. The media has not been fair. It has not been balanced. Probably now that we are having this conversation, All right. it is about time that the media consider that these airwaves that you enjoy belong to the public. Thank you. You have a responsibility to provide fair and objective coverage to all political players within the Kenyan political space. Thank you, Excellency. We now move to the next item, which is on governance and uh, institutions underneath the Constitution. And Jesse Rogers will be taking us through that. Okay, Your Excellency, perhaps just to begin on Martyr's governance, I'd like to touch on your declaration that government appointments are sort of a preserve of those who voted in favor of the Kenya Kwanzaa government. Just perhaps to put the words into context, quote unquote, this is what you mentioned, the government is a company that has shares, their owners who have majority shares and those with just a few, while others do not have any. You invested in this government, you must reap. That's what you're quoted as saying. And as a matter of fact, we believe today you agitated for the same message at Tharakanifi County while you were with the president. And that begs the question, this is a symbol of national unity, the presidency. And in fact, is it your sincere thought that this is how governments should work? Thank you very much for asking that question. It's a very pertinent question. What I said in Kiricho, and I believe in it, is that a government is like a company. I didn't say a government is a company. I said it's like a company. Uh. In every company, there are shares. Preferential shares, ordinary shares. When there is an AGM, non-shareholders do not attend the AGM. When there are dividends to be divided, they are divided according to the number of shares. That is the truth. What I said is that as a government in terms of development, in terms of public resources, all Kenyans must be treated equally. And the president does not dish out development. Appropriation of funds for development is done by the National Assembly. And all parties are represented through the budget cycle. And therefore, the issue of discrimination in far as resources are concerned, is non-existent. All Kenyans are taxpayers. And the government of President William Ruto and I will serve all Kenyans equally in matters development. In fact, last month, the President and I, an entire government, were in Luwanyanza, where we were not voted in uh, unacceptable, accept, what I would call an acceptable manner. We got very few votes, and we are thankful for those few votes. We were in Siaya. Uh, unveiling development projects. We are in uh, Homabe. We were doing uh, 2,000 uh, affordable housing. We were doing a pyre at Homabe. We were in Kisumu. Because even if those people did not vote for us, they are Kenyans and they pay taxes. But when it comes to forming government, no president anywhere in the world would invite people to his government who, da who do not believe in him, who do not believe in his agenda who cannot support him because they don't understand his agenda. And that is where the issue of shares came. That it is by the number of shares that you have with that administration that demonstrates your commensurate commitment to the success of that government. And I give an example. I said if you are a farmer and you are planting, you plant, you wind, you apply fertilizer, you irrigate, when the time comes to harvest, you go to the shamba and harvest. But a fellow who was standing by the fence, shouting at you and saying, you farmer, you are foolish. That means you are planting will get nowhere. That seed is rotten. This farming cannot succeed in this area. Farming is not a good thing as we are livestock herders. How then can you invite that person to come and assist you to harvest? He doesn't believe in you. What I said in parables, 
And I like using figurative language because I'm a student of literature. And it's one of the most effective ways of communicating to the people, especially the people down there at the bottom of the pyramid. And that's, that's my gift. I talk to the people directly. What I was saying, the people who are opposed to President William Ruto, mm -hmm. saying that he's a thief, he's incapable of running this country, he has no agenda, the economic, up, the economic, the bottom-up economic transformative agenda is useless. There is no way we can allow him to invite those people to his cabinet, to be his principal secretaries, to be ambassadors. They do not believe in him. They do not believe in his agenda. How, ca how then can they come and demand to be included in that government? That's what I was saying. Okay. When I go to state house, and I said, I fight them there yeah. every day. That's what I said. I fight them there. People who are shouting at President William Ruto, saying he's useless, he is a thief, he will ruin this country, and they are there lining up that they want to be given positions. I say, no, let us first give positions to those who believe in President William Ruto, okay. to those who believe in the bottom-up economic transformative agenda. Those are the people who will help him. And let me tell you, before you, you tell me, that is a mistake President Uhuru Kenyatta made. He went and brought people through the handshake who did not believe in the Big Four agenda, who did not believe in the Jubilee agenda, people who had been opposed to his leadership, people who had been opposed to his economic programs. He brought them into his government. What happened? Everything came to a standstill. The economy got destroyed. By the time he left, the country was finished. We cannot make that mistake. And that is what I meant. But yeah. in matters development, okay. in matters public resources, <laughs> Every Kenyan will benefit from this government. Your Excellency, with all due respect, Article 38 of the Constitution talks about political rights in the sense that every citizen is free to make political choices. That is a fundamental right and freedom. Absolutely. So what are you saying by saying yeah, the former president made a mistake to bring other people who never supported him into government? And what are you saying? Because if... It's a right for every Kenyan to make it's a, a right. choice. It's a right. And then tied to Article 131 as the presidency, the symbol of unity. That is true. So in essence, what that, is, that is true. But choices have consequences. That is true. It's a political right to who choose whoever you want. But choices have consequences. Okay. There is no way you can say you don't believe in William Ruto. You don't believe in his programs. You don't believe in his, uh, what he stands for and then you want to be a member of his cabinet. How can you help him to, to transform the country? How can you help him govern? What I'm saying is, even in those areas where we are not voted for, we have people in the cabinet who believe in us. It does not mean because that area did not vote for us. Everybody in that area does not believe in us. Eliud Awalo from Shire believed in William Ruto and the bottom-up economic transformation agenda. And that is why today he is cabinet secretary for ICT. Remo Domolo, he believed in Dr. William Ruto and the bottom-up economic transformation agenda. That is today why he is a PS for interior. Mr. Kobundo is a CS for trade. We are saying in every part of the country, there are those who believed in President William Ruto and his programs. So what we are telling us new people, when you make a bed, you must lie on it. Okay. Don't force us but to take people who don't believe in us. Among your support base, we have people who believe in us. Those are the ones we shall choose, and those are the ones who will join our government. And in every part of this country, every community is represented. The issue we have with Azimio, they want us to bring us as a mere people okay. in our government. But we Deputy President... Because they'll sabotage our government, the way they sabotage the Uru Kenyatta. We cannot agree. Deputy President, in all fairness, you know, you can say whatever you, you've said, but the a mere people are not here to say they're not lining at State House for government. You'll call them to ask them. But in all fairness, I'm saying, can you maybe say a few names, one or two, who are these people? I don't have to say because, let me tell you, these people, one... They say they don't recognize President William Ruto, and they don't recognize his government. Then the following day they are saying this government is discriminating against us. How? If you don't believe in the president, if you don't believe in his government, how then do you expect to be included in his government and you have said yourself publicly 
in broad daylight that you don't recognize him, that he is not in office legally, yet you are claiming you want your supporters who are clapping when you are saying you don't recognize William Ruto to be in your government. On a further note, when we try to reach out to everybody for national cohesion, for national unity, we hosted members of parliament from ODM from Nuanyanza. What happens? They were whipped, they were threatened, they were thrown out of meetings. So these people, they are speaking from both sides of the mouth. They are saying on one hand, we want to be included in the government of President William Ruto. On another hand, they are saying we don't recognize President William Ruto. When a few leaders decide that it makes sense to engage the president, to discuss development with him, because the elections are over, they go and have a meeting with the president. The MP for Langata Jalango was thrown out of the meeting. The other nine MPs are the siege. The party leader of ODM is fighting them in every meeting for going to engage with the president. What do these people from Azimio want from us? One, they say they don't recognize us. On the other hand, they want to be part of government. When we say, okay, come, we talk, they discipline the people who have come to speak to us. What are we supposed to do? Okay, Excellency, and just as we wrap up, upon this, there are two contrasting issues here. You have talked about the masses and the people who you said are lining up at State House looking for opportunities in government. I mean, the Constitution only recognizes Kenyans as one. There are no primary or secondary Kenyans. Two, during your oath of office on the 13th of September, you said that you will administer this country as the deputy president yes. without fear, yes. favor, yes. or ill will. Yes. There is the aspect of qualification, yes. competence, yes. hard work, yes. and meritocracy. Yes. I mean, when you describe the country as a shareholding company, figuratively you said, yes. this is so inferior to the position of the Constitution that establishes this country as a constitutional democracy. This coming from the deputy president, isn't it appalling that you said the Kenya is more or less a shareholding company? Uh, there's nothing appalling. It's, it depends on the way you look at it. The people I was speaking to are more than happy. I spoke today in Taraka. It was thunderous reception. They associate with those comments. That is the political reality of this country. Move away from theory. Governments all over the world come with their own people when they form government. And they don't go to look outside there. They look, upon, they look from among people they know. People who believe in what they stand for. As deputy president, I took an oath of office to serve the whole country. That is why I spent three days in Luanyanza. I was in Siaya, I was in Homabe, I was in Kisumu. But that does not mean for me to look national. I go, I get somebody who was abusing President William Ruto, saying that he is not capable, that he has no idea how to run the country, and bring him into his government so that he comes and sabotage the government uh, from within. I am saying, once beaten, twice shy. President Uhuru Kenyatta made that mistake. Okay. He brought characters into his government who did not believe in him, who did not believe in his agenda. And in the process, they messed the whole four big agenda. They messed the whole Jubilee transformative agenda, transformative agenda because they did not believe in it. William Ruto will not make that mistake. He'll embrace all Kenyans from all communities. But the people to help him manage the affairs of this country are those who believe in him, are those who believe in the bottom-up economic transport agenda, and those who believe in his leadership. Those are the men and women from across Kenya, from all communities, that he'll assemble to help him to govern this country. Your Excellency, Your Excellency um, just a quick one. Your Excellency, to some they say you appear to be always in a combative mode. Some say at any opportunity with a mic you lecture Kenyans. Is the truthful man a bitter man? Kenyans, just like I said, have a right to say what they want. This is democracy. Kenyans have every right to describe my character. I am a person, and you should have known me by now. I speak from my heart. I say what is in my heart. I'm a truthful man. I'm an honest man. Kenyans are not used to honesty. And many people have a problem with that. And I want to tell you, let me tell you, my brother, you people of the media, you know, demeaned me, you called me names, you drew caricatures against me, you said I'm uncultured, I'm uncouth, 
I am a villager. I am all that. But on the 9th of August, the people of Kenya, 7.2 million Kenyans disagreed with you and say this man called Regati Gashagwa, we like his style of leadership. He's a truthful, he's an honest man. We can entrust him with leadership. I accept and welcome criticism from the media, from the social media, from everybody. But let me tell you, nobody will ever change me. Okay. I am natural. I will never change my language. I will never change my character. I will never change the way I speak. I will always speak from my heart. Unless the people of Kenya tell me to stop. And as I go around the country, because I do, I'm everywhere. Kenyans urge me on. Okay. Yeah, they urge me on. So, but I welcome criticism okay, okay. from the media, Excellent. social media, from columnists. They are all welcome to criticize me. Mm. And uh, myself, I know who are my employers. I know who matters in the whole of this equation. I know, I know my preferences. Okay. Thank you. I know who matters. Okay. That person who matters to me and my leadership is the one I normally talk to, okay. not the media. You only put me, by the way, I normally don't address you. I address the people, okay. I talk to Kenyans, and I have a chemistry with the Kenyan people, and I'm persuaded I'm on the right track, and I'm not gonna change. I will remain a natural person. Your Excellency, um, you've talked about cohesion and reaching out to members, or rather leaders from the opposition side. Uh, you've said that you invited some ODM MPs in Parliament, and uh, later on they were de-whipped. What criteria did you use? Did you just cherry pick, or you issued the invites to everyone, including the party leader, ODM leader, Ailodi? We talked to those who want to talk to us. People reach out. We have talked to Jubilee. They reached us out. We said welcome. Those LDA members of Parliament reached out to us. We said welcome. We are willing to engage with anybody who has an idea on how we can improve our economy, on how we can make this country better, on how we can improve the living standards of our people. The doors of President William Ruto are open. My doors are open. You have seen, I embrace leaders like Honorable Kanini Kega who used to abuse me and say that I should go to prison in Nyeri so that the locals can be bringing me Uji. But I embraced him because he reached out. We are not bitter with anybody. What people mistake with bitterness is the truth. Mm. You know, many people do not want to hear the truth. When I said in Kasarani that we inherited a dilapidated economy, people thought that I'm bitter with President Uru Kenyatta. I was just simply being honest. When I said we got empty coffers, I was simply being honest. People mistake honesty with bitterness. Okay. We have no bitterness. We have come in, Jubilee people are with us, ODM people are with us, we have taken action against nobody, we have not used a criminal justice system to hunt anybody, we are open, we are saying come, we okay. talk, we work together, we are willing, we have no problem with anybody. Na matamshi yako kuhusiana na kukaribisha viongozi wote na ya kwamba kama serikali ya Kenya kwanza mko tayari kuzungumza na kiongozi kutoka upande wote na tumeshuhudia wengi wakija pale state house ambapo wamezungumza na rais. Uh, je ni dalili ya handshake na vile vile kama Kenya kwanza unaweza ukasema sasa hivi ya kwamba ume hauna machungu na wale viongozi ambao wakati wa kampeni walikuwa hawaungi mkono upande wa Kenya kwanza. I have no bitterness with anybody. Honorable Kanini Kega used all sorts of insults against me. He was instrumental in my problems. He is the one who was working with Uru Kenyatta to persecute me. But when he reached me out, I'm a leader, and uh, the elections are over. I told Kanini Kega, come, we work together. I am willing to talk to anybody who wants to talk to us. And we are talking to many people. Some come during the day, others come at night depending on how they look at things. I'll continue to talk to leaders at night. We'll continue to talk to leaders during the day. And those who are willing to talk to us, we are ready. President William Ruto and I are Christians. We are not faithful. We have no bitterness against anybody. All we are saying is that we must be truthful. If that truth cuts somebody, so be it. There's nothing we can do about it. You know, sometimes when we speak the truth, you think we are against so and so, we are bitter. We have no bitterness with anybody. We are good people. We've got a big heart. We want to embrace everybody. Let us come and build this country together. Okay. On that bit, uh, Mr. Deputy President, someone would argue that you people, even uh, after you were sworn in, you said you want a strong opposition. But here today, 
you, your party, UDA, is looking for, you know, to court MPs from ODM and Azimio and other parties including Jubilee Party, are you not weakening the same opposition you, you said you want a strong opposition? We are not quoting anybody, they are quoting us. What do you want us to do when they come to us? When Jubilee MPs want to see the president, he is the president of Kenya, including those Jubilee characters, he is their president. He is a father figure of this country. When they come knocking, our doors are open. We will not lock anybody out. In fact, we believe in very strong opposition. In fact, the problems of this country began with a handshake when we killed the opposition and got involved in a mongrel of a government. You don't know who is opposition and who is government. And there was no check and balance. And theft and plunder of resources started from that day. The president has recommended to the National Assembly various amendments to the Constitution to create the office of the leader of official opposition so that whoever is there has a platform, a legal platform, to go to the National Assembly, funded by the state, with vehicles, with support staff, with research staffers, to provide effective oversight on government. We have no intention whatsoever to muscle the opposition. We actually want to strengthen the opposition. And otherwise, we are saying we have no need for hardship. And by the way, there will be no hardship with anybody. If those people want to talk to us on matters development, mm -hmm. we are ready. But them coming to join government, no. We want the opposition to remain strong. We want them to agree with our people in the National Assembly. They agree and amend the Constitution, create the office of the leader of official opposition by law so that he gets resources, okay. so that he gets support, to provide oversight of a government. A strong opposition is a good thing for any country. On that, and we want a strong opposition. On that bit, um, your new sec gen of UDA, Clifford Malala, is on record saying that uh, you as a party, UDA, you want other parties, affiliate parties in Kenya Kwanza to fold. Do you still hold that thought? That even ANC, uh, the other parties, uh, including PA, uh, including Ford Kenya, do you still want them to fold? That is, UDA. that is Marara's idea of making UDA as a strong party. Cleo Marara is a very energetic young leader, and I, and I really have a lot of time for him. When President William Ruto and I, and our National Executive Council, decided to pick him to be the Secretary General of UDA, is because we really appreciated his qualities, his energy, his passion and vigor. And that is what we need for a party. Probably his style is a little bit different. I have discussed with him, we don't want to coerce anybody to fold up. That is not necessary. He can make an invitation for people to fold up and join UDA. They don't have to. And we are happy the way we are in Kenya Kwanza. We are happy with the existing framework. But if along the way, the constituent parties consider it desirable to fold up and join UDA, so be it. If they want to remain independent within the Kenya Kwanza framework, so be it. Okay. So it was just Malala's way of bringing energy into the party. And, and the president and I have told him okay. to proceed, to, to market the party, to make it very vigorous, to make it very, very active. But we don't want to coerce anybody. Okay, anybody, if ANC wants to come and fold up, okay. fair enough. If they don't want to, fair enough. Okay. We, we just proceed. Okay, Excellency. Um, before we proceed to the next topic, which is of concern to the Kenyan people, the cost of living and the economy, which Eric will be starting us off. One final question on governance. And one of the premise upon which your government was formed, and you told the Kenyan people this is a listening government, is the aspect of the rule of law and constitutionalism. Mm. You were recently in Nakuru County in defiance of a court order. Why? I was not in defiance of any court order because none had been served on me. Okay, let me just cut you. Let me just cut you. This was in relation to the removal, the recalling of Peter Mwanzo, the former Nakuru County commander who was in Nakuru County to Vigilance House. And you said you went there knowingly that these people are not going anywhere. That's what you said. I quote you verbatim. I've come here with iron sheets food and 10,000 for each of the family evicted. The county commander has been removed. Two quick questions there. Why did you defy a court order? And was the former county commander recalled to Vigilance House
by that directive that you made in Nakuru County? I did not defy any court order because none was served on me. You defy a court order if it has been served on you. Let me say the following. We are a country of the rule of law. We are a country that obeys court orders. There was no court order as far as I'm concerned. Okay, well, were you issued with your court order? No, I have not been issued. You are not party though. So there were two parties in court. Yeah, yeah, let, listen, let, okay. let, let, let me finish. Allow me to get the... Yeah, I, I know what you are saying. Okay. I'm, I'm explaining. Okay, but you are not part... That court order okay. did not direct the police commander to oversee the destruction of property. That court order did not direct the police commander to oversee brutal eviction of children and women. That court order called for eviction. It did not call for brutal eviction of children and women. It did not call for destruction of property. What we have told police, and I want to repeat here for the record, if there is a court order asking police to provide security for eviction, that order should be obeyed. But there is a way to obey it. Which is the way? I am explaining. Okay. You table that order before the county security intelligence team to discuss the manner of eviction. One, to ensure there is no eviction done at night. There will be no night eviction in this country as long as William Ruto is president. Why do you want to evict people at night? So that you steal their property, so that there is no accountability, you rape women, you rape children. There is nobody in this country, as long as William Ruto is president, no police officer anywhere in this country will oversee an eviction at night. That is one. That eviction was done at night. As a signal had been issued when President William Ruto came to office by the Inspector General of Police, directing all police commanders in Kenya that there shall never be a night eviction. That is why we removed him. During the night, property belonging to those poor men was stolen. Women were raped. Property was destroyed. I am Deputy President of William Ruto. I cannot sit in Nairobi when an overzealous police officer using police officers paid by the public, using guns owned by the people, of, by, the, by the taxpayers, using ammunition, go and oversee a brutal eviction in the middle of the night against hapless women and children. That will not happen. Number two, the police in that uh, county committee on security and intelligence, a discussion will be arrived at on how to evict people in an orderly manner so that people are not brutalized. We have come from a government, the government that was there, mm -hmm. the Uhuru administration, that was heartless, that brutalized its own citizens under the supervision of police. So I am saying we'll obey every court order, okay. but within the realms of the law. Okay. There is no order from any court saying that the eviction should be done at night. All things that are done at night are not good things. Why can't they do it during the day when everybody can see? That is why the police commander was removed, because there was a signal, clear. And I asked IG for that signal and he said it to me, very clear. There is no eviction at night. Because why do you want to do it at night? What has happened in this country? In the last administration by Uru Kenyatta, the policemen went wrong. And they brutalized the people of Kenya. You remember what happened in Kariobangi, what happened in Ruai. Kenyans were brutalized during COVID, when there are floods, when it's raining, under the watch of policemen. I am saying that will not happen, and that is why I went to Zubukia to apologize to those people that our own government, a government they elected to office okay. on the platform of not allowing brutal evictions, had actually supervised okay. brutal eviction against the people of Kenya. Just on, on yes or no is aspect, because it's still to cut you verbatim, you said any police commander should notify the county security committee and intelligence before executing any orders for eviction. 
if evictions have to be done for whatever reason, even with court order, it has to be discussed by the county security committee. We have instructed the attorney general to review the case. If that court order then, and the evictions as per the order happen during the day, will you defy the court order? Nobody, the court order will be obeyed, but its implementation will be done according to our rules. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, just on that, and very briefly, before we move on to the next um, uh, topic of discussion, when the Kenya Kwanzaa administration took over, you said that you're handing the National Police Service its own budget to make it uh, independent. Are you confirming now that the executive still has a hand in how the National Police Service operates? The police service, the police, the National Police Service is independent. We have given the Inspector General. Uh, financial autonomy. He is now the accounting officer. Okay. He needs no direction from anybody on how to work. But the government also has policies. And the Inspector General of Police has been hired by President William Ruto. Mm -hmm. President William Ruto has a manifesto. He has a covenant with the people of Kenya. One of the things that we agreed with the people of Kenya is that there will be no brutal evictions at night. When President William Ruto hired Japheth Kobe as IG, he made it very clear to him on what had been agreed on with the people of Kenya. Mm -hmm. And before he took the job, he agreed that the policies that had been agreed on in matters policing will be observed. Okay. And let me tell you, we have a very, very professional Inspector General of Police, Japheth Kobe. Mm -hmm. We have a very professional CS for Interior, uh, Professor uh, Kindiki. Other than that one isolated incident, we have not had any other. And that is very good. Okay. You know, since we came in today, six months, since we were sworn in Seven on the 13th. I think it's six. We were sworn in on the uh, 13th of September. 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 Mm -hmm. So I think it's six, six months today. We have not had any violation of what we agreed with the Inspector General Police. And I'm very happy myself. Even when I discussed with the IG on that issue, he dealt with it very fast. And uh, action was taken and things have been normalized. Thank you. We do not interfere with the way police carry out their operations, mm -hmm. but there are certain policies that were a covenant between the people of Kenya and President William Ruto. And all those who have given jobs must adhere to those uh, policies. Fair enough, sir. Um, let's talk about the cost of living. And one of the things that we have to talk about is the cost of power. And I want to quote um, the chair of the Presidential Council of Economic Advisors, that is David D. I believe that his position is the official government of Kenya position. Um, using his verified Twitter handle, he said on power bills, we have two choices, costly power available 24-7, or cheap power available a few hours a day like South Africa. And um, he went, I had to say, if you care to peruse our manifesto, you would have noted that cheap power does not feature in our pledges on electricity. But um, your manifesto actually had promised to lower the cost of electricity in a three-point plan. Um, referencing that tweet by David D., I have two questions. When should Kenyans expect um, the cost of electricity to be lowered? And two, is the government planning uh, to introduce power rationing? First and foremost, uh, David D. is an advisor to the president. He does not pronounce policy. Public policy is pronounced by the president, the deputy president, and the respective cabinet secretary. So I would not want to go into that uh, as far as I'm concerned. If that, if that pronouncement came from the CS Davis Churchill, I'll be able to, to talk on it. Mm. Uh, I want to say that uh, the government is concerned about the cost of power. And uh, a lot of things are happening behind the scenes. We are having a problem because of the prolonging drought mm -hmm. and the effects of climate change and five failed consecutive seasons. All electricity generated uh, through hydro, mm -hmm. there is a problem. And in another two, three weeks, will have a very serious shortage. So the idea has been to expand to geothermal, solar energy, and wind energy, progressively in terms of long-term solutions. Because like the independent power producers are very expensive mm. because they use diesel, and diesel is very, even in your own home, you have a standby generator, you know how expensive it is. So the government is well-sized that the issue of cost of power 
is uh, affecting the economy badly because it brings up the cost of manufacturing and that cost of manufacturing due to cost of power is past the consumer. So along the way, there are many things going on which I don't want to delve in at this stage because they are still at the policy level. They are still at a discussion in cabinet. I don't want to diverge what is going on in cabinet, but I want to assure the people of Kenya that there, are, there is a big team of men and women, experts on power, who are burning the midnight oil mm -hmm. to come up with sources of alternative energy mm -hmm. with a view of bringing the cost of power down in, to boost manufacturing and production. Because as long as the cost of power is up, mm -hmm. we will not be able to bring down the cost of living. So it is something that there is a team of men and women who are working day and night mm -hmm. And in the next several weeks, there will be a policy pronouncement on that aspect of what the government intends to do to bring down the cost of power. Is, Is rationing an option on the table? I, I can't say at this stage. I, I am hoping we will not get a South African state where we have to ration. Okay. I, I, I hope we will not be able to get there. I was in okay. South Africa in December, okay. and it's not a very decent way of life. Okay. But I am saying that discussion is going on. We need to appraise the situation. What are the water levels? Uh, what is um, the amount of power we can get from the hydro dams? What is it that we can get from geothermal? What is it we can get from solar? What is it we can get from wind? What is it that we can get from across the country? You know, against our overall requirement. Okay. And then decisions will be made depending on the okay. deficit. Okay. All right, Mr. Deputy President, looking at the cost of basic commodities such as unga and such commodities, would you say that in the six months that you have been in power, you've done enough, the most that could, you could have done as a government? Uh, I think we have done extremely well. When we came in, the cost of unga was between 230 to 250. And at that time, mm -hmm there was a subsidy. Despite the subsidy, which was, you know, which cost the government 8 billion, and which of course was stolen, the UNGA was 250, between 230 to 250. We have worked very hard. And now UNGA, depending on where you are buying, is between 170 to 191. As of this afternoon, at um, Naiva supermarket, it was 178 uh, per two, kilo, 2 kg. And I think coming down to 50 shillings, 45 shillings, without patting ourselves on the back, I think we have done extremely well. And that has been short term. The long term, we decided as a government, and uh, under the wise leadership of President William Ruto, on advice of serious economists, that subsidizing consumption is foolish because it's not sustainable. You cannot subsidize consumption. And the president was well advised and after analyzing all the advice from all sorts of experts and economists and putting his own thinking into it, decided that the way to go is to subsidize production. And that is why Immediately after coming into office, we set money aside to subsidize the cost of fertilizer. Fertilizer that was going a 50 kg bag at 7,000 is now 3,500. The net effect of that is that the farmers will get a better yield at a lower cost of production. And that benefit will be passed to the consumer. So looking at the way things are going, all factors being constant, God being merciful mm -hmm. and giving us good rain, we have prepared the farmers well. Mm -hmm. In the bread basket, 16 counties, our bread basket, we have sufficient fertilizer. I went to Mombasa personally to oversee the distribution of that fertilizer. I was in Kericho to ensure that it has reached. I saw with my own two eyes. All farmers have fertilizer and are ready for the long range planting. All factors being constant, with God's mercy, we are going to have a bumper harvest with high yield mm. and at a lower cost of production. That should be able to set the cost of Uga down 150, 140, all the way to 120. And we believe that if 
eventually we can stabilize the cost of wood at 120, 110, 115. We think that is fairly comfortable for the people of Kenya. So I think we have done well. So when I see these Mandamano characters making noise at us, the question I'm asking is one. They are telling us that they are going for Mandamano for us to bring down the cost of Unga. When Unga was at 230, they never called for Mandamano. They were right inside the government. The president of Uru Kenyatta said his advisor is Raida Odinga. He's on record. Raida Odinga never called Mandamano when Unga was at 230. Why is he calling for Mandamano when Unga is at 178? It's double speak. Number two, he had an opportunity then as the advisor of President Uru Kenyatta without having to go to Mandamano. He was part of Gaben. He would have advised his hardship brother on how to bring the cost of Unga down. Just how foolish do these people think Kenyans are? These are the same Kenyans who are buying Unga between 230 and 250 during the reign of the Hardship Brothers. There is a new government that has brought Unga down by 50 shillings, 45, all the way up to 178, 175. I think without blowing our own trumpet, mm -hmm. I think we are not doing very badly. We are not doing <coughs> as much as we would have wanted. But telling us to subsidize Unga, we are not going to do that because it's not sustainable, it is foolish. In any case, there is no mechanism that is proven to subsidize Unga. Mm -hmm. We have sat down with millers, and I said I will speak. Four billion shillings were released from the National Treasury to subsidize Unga. We went throughout this country, and I want to challenge the people of Kenya. No Kenyan anywhere saw a packet of Unga at 100 shillings. Those millers are demanding money from us. Mm. They only received 1.7 billion. 2.3 billion shillings was stolen. They are saying they did not receive the money, and the money left the National Treasury. We are saying, why these people are calling for Madamano to return the Unga subsidy is because the network of stealing that money for Unga subsidy belongs to them. So they want us to release another two billion, okay. which the National Assembly has refused. Deputy President, you had um, a strategy to reduce uh, the cost of specifically maize. Yes. In January, President William Ruto is on record in Eldoret saying your government has a strategy to import cheap maize, free duty maize, by end of February. And um, even the CS for Agriculture, Medical and Turi, including Moses Korea of Trade, they're on record saying it. But now, after the end of, we are now in March, there is no importation of cheap maize. Kenyans are waiting for this. Yes. Where is the maize? It's good you have asked that question. The maize is not available anywhere in the world. The CS for Agriculture and the PS, the Honorable Mithika Linturi, were in Zambia, which produces maize, and there is no maize available. The only maize that is available in South Africa, and we are in competition with Angola and Rwanda for the same maize. The maize in Brazil, bringing it here because of the distance, the cost is too high. We decided as a government that the government is not going to import any maize directly because we don't want corruption. And we, the government doesn't want to get involved in importation directly because we don't want scandals. We don't want people in government to get into business. We advertise for millers and other people to apply to be given permit to import duty-free maize so that we can bring down the cost of maize flour. Unfortunately, and I'm sorry to tell the people of Kenya, there's no maize almost everywhere in the world. Are you now saying that the Kenyans listen, should wait? Listen, listen, I'm just saying it is a difficult situation. It is uh, two months ago, almost three, when we gave people to import maize. Mm -hmm. And most of those people we gave maize, they are in they are telling us whatever they have gone, they are competing with governments for the same maize. There is a problem of maize availability everywhere in the world. And, we are, and that is why the president sent Bithika uh, Linturi to discuss on a government-to-government -government program between the government of Zambia and the <coughs> government of Kenya. And they have said the earliest they can give us maize is September. So what we are saying is that we are asking Last week, the cabinet approved 
the importation of another 500,000 metric tons of maize, this time not to freelance importers, but to the millers themselves. And we have sat down with the millers. And they have said that uh, they have established good contacts. And they can pull resources together because of economies of scale they can be able to compete with governments. Because what is happening is that other governments across the world are competing for the same maize. I don't want to portray a very dark mm. future, but I want to say that it is not easy. And I speak honestly because sometimes I think Kenyans deserve the truth. Okay. Because when you prepare them for the truth, it's normally a good thing. Right. Everything is being done. And I was in Eldoret. They are two ships in the high seas with maize. And I told the people of Eldoret and Kitale, the farmers there have been holding maize and spitting higher prices. And the prices are already very good at 6,000 per, uh, per 90 kg bag. And I did tell the farmers, when these two ships arrive in the country and the maize is offloaded into the market, the prices will come down. Please, release your maize. If the farmers in our bread basket counties, the 16 of them agree to release the maize that they have, if they can be patriotic Kenyans, to understand that people of Kenya need food, and the maize they are holding is making the prices go up, if they can agree as early as tomorrow to release the maize that they are holding into the market, the prices of Wunga will come down even to 140. So I want to use this platform mm -hmm. to make an appeal to all maize farmers across the country, to be patriotic, to think of their brothers and sisters who are suffering, to consider at the current prices which are very good, by any standard for the farmer and bad for the consumer, for the benefit of the consumer and the Kenyan people, to consider to release into the market all the stocks of maize that they are holding. Okay, Mr. Deputy President, thank you. And again, we have also agreed. Okay. The animal feeds millers are competing with human beings for maize for the animals. So what we have done again, the cabinet has approved the importation of yellow maize for livestock, uh, for, 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 for animal feed millers, so that they stop competing for the white maize. And that will lessen the strain on us. So we are saying, the yellow maize that has been approved by government to be imported duty free for our for animal feeds i want to ask the miller i met them personally to take advantage of that widow import as much as they can and produce uh, feeds for the animals again yellow maize for those who wish the government does not want to recommend it to anybody to eat yellow maize but yellow maize is good okay if you go to the supermarket there is yellow maize, and the price is higher than white maize. It's very nutritious. But for those Kenyans who may want to consider okay. Okay, sir. to consume yellow maize, we are importing both for human beings and for animals. When you okay, say that there is no maize anywhere, and I remember the president in his Jamhuri speech, he said maize that was expected in January, an assortment of foodstuffs, that was the wording he used. Then the two CSS came and informed the the nation that uh, maize will come and you've said you are speaking the truth you've gone around the world there's no maize anywhere did the government mislead Kenya? maize is available mm -hmm. but the prices are higher than what we have here okay the maize that is cheaper that we can bring in is what is having a problem you can bring maize as far from brazil from america it's fine but because of the cost of transportation when you add the price of maize in America, in Brazil, in Argentina, when you add the cost of transportation, you find that the price will be higher than what we have here, which then defeats the purpose of the importation. So the idea is that we get the millers to join, as they have agreed. There is a lot of maize in South Africa. They pull so that they are able to buy in bulk, because what is happening in South Africa, they want to sell in bulk. Okay. And the people we have given that importation are not able to buy in bulk. So there is a strategy by giving 500,000 metric tons to the millers
to import from South Africa or elsewhere, and that will be able to deal with the problem. Okay, Your Excellency, let me take you back to the issue of fertilizers. And you mentioned that you were in Mombasa and you're satisfied um, by the way fertilizer is being distributed. Um, just a quick research shows we have about 14,000 uh, registered farmers in the uh, fertilizer subsidy program, only 4,600 currently have received um, fertilizer. And then um, there's also the issue of decentralization. A lot of farmers or their representatives that we uh, talk to say that there's the issue of decentralization. Most of them have to travel all the way to Kitale. Yes. Um, and then the fertilizer that they have is the NPK type, um, but they prefer the DAP to the NPK type. Uh, I just want you to address the issue of decentralization and the issue of farmers saying that they have not been involved uh, when it comes to making such crucial uh, decisions. No, uh, we are a responsible government that has done research and done tests on the soil and determined the kind of fertilizer that is required, and that is NPK. DAP causes a, a, has a problem with acidity, and most of the soils in the breadbasket areas uh, are very acidic, and therefore when you put DAP, it does not help the farmer. Mm -hmm. But the farmers have a tradition. And sometimes when you have used DAP all your life, you simply want to continue using DAP. But this government is a responsible government. It has done uh, soil testing and determined that uh, DAP is not the correct uh, type of fertilizer. Okay. But those who wish to buy DAP is available at the normal price in the shops. Okay. But for the subsidized one, uh, it is the one that is recommended by government. Mm. Your statistics are not true. We have enough fertilizer everywhere. In fact, what we have done, we have had now added the counties of Kisi and Nyamira. Initially, we had uh, Kiricho, Bomet, uh, Usiangishu, Transoya, Bungoma, uh, Kakamega, Nakuru, Narok. Okay. And uh, we have now added uh, Kisi and Nyamira and uh, a bit of Baringo in terms of the areas of Damara Vein. What we have agreed with the county governments, they are partnering with the national government okay. so that they offer the last mile distribution. What we have requested the governors to do, where we have national cities and produce board depot, mm -hmm. the governors, because agriculture is an involved function, can open many depots and sub-depots in every constituency. Mm -hmm. And when I was in um, and Gishu, that matter came, and we discussed with our governor there, uh, Kotimoja, and we agreed. And I think that is going on. So I want also to take this opportunity to speak to all our county governors, wherever they are, uh, and plead with them to fast track and hasten the opening up of uh, sub depots and mini depots okay. to take the fertilizer nearer the people so that we save them the cost of okay. transportation okay. and the bother of leaving their farms to go and queue for fertilizer. Thank you. Um, but as, as we speak, I want to confirm that we have sufficient stocks of fertilizer across uh, those counties. And progressively, this is a pilot. It's going to be reflected across the country for other crops, not just maize. Okay, but, but uh, Excellency, Mr. President, before we transition, you said sufficient fertilizer, but the NCPB in Kitale, Transoya County, they say they need 400,000 bucks of fertilizer. They only received uh, 80,000. I think of 320,000. The, the process is ongoing. Uh, they don't even have the facility to stock 400,000. What we have encar encouraged them to do is dispense as it arrives. And the process is continuous. Every day, uh, and you know the fertilizer we have uh, bought, we have also encouraged, you know, the, 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 the bagging and the packing to be done in Mombasa right. so that we can also create employment. Right. So what is happening is that it's a continuous process. The bagging and the, the laboring is going on in Mombasa. We are using SGR, we are using trucks, and we are dispensing the fertilizer as it comes. But we have sufficient fertilizer for the long range for those counties that deal with the production of our grains. The All process right. is ongoing, yes. This promise of fertilizer started on day one in Kasarani. It's now six months. Yeah, yeah. but it's fertilizer. It's not a promise. <laughs> It's going on. <laughs> April is here now. No, 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 no. There is, like, I, there is, there is the, the issue of fertilizer is not a promise. It's happening. And uh, I was in Kitale. I distributed the fertilizer. I was in Mombasa. There were, your people were there. The stores are full. The trains are full. In fact, the problem we are having is transportation. The SGR cannot cope with the speed of how we want it done. But the issue of the availability of fertilizer okay. is not an issue. Okay. It's sufficient yes. fertilizer in the country. Okay, Excellency, we are into the last 15 minutes and we now transition to education and Nancy Okwari will take us through.
Well, thank you so much. Uh, we can start by talking about the transition to junior secondary school. And it has been marred by parents complaining about congestion in classes, lack of textbooks, and recently when he appeared before the Senate Committee on Education, the Cabinet Secretary said that 55,000 learners, over 55,000 learners are yet to report to junior secondary school. Would you say that as a country we are well on course? Well, the CBC is a difficult matter because it was rushed without proper public participation. I remember the former CS for Education, CS Amina Abdallah, had said that we wait for a while. And the then president could hear none of it and he ordered for it to be rolled out. And as a result, it was rushed. It is a, it's a paradigm shift in our education system in terms of the curriculum, in terms of teachers, in terms of physical facilities. The country was not ready. It was rushed. So when we were campaigning, we had a session with all stakeholders in matters education. And they took us through the challenges of CBC. And on assuming office, the first month, President William Ruto established the Presidential Working Party on educational reforms. That party, led by Professor Rafael Munavu, has traveled the breadth and width, traveled the breadth and width of this country and talked to stakeholders, pupils, teachers, parents, educationists, private uh, owners of schools, and they are in the last stage of compiling a report. But they did submit uh, an interim report to the president because we needed to make certain decisions. Because you know there was an exam for the pupils in Saturday 6 and they needed to know what is their future. And the report that came to the president and the president concurred, the recommendation by the people of Kenya through the Presidential Working Party on Education and Reforms was that junior secondary school be domiciled in primary schools. And that decision has been made. Already there is a crisis. The crisis would have been tenfold had we proceeded on the initial plan of those young boys and girls going to secondary school. Already the parents are having a challenge even affording the school uniform for the junior secondary school. And the president has directed the Minister for Education to make sure that no child is barred from going to class on an account of not having a uniform for the junior secondary school. So I want to say that there are good elements in CBC, mm -hmm. but there is quite a number of issues that require serious reform. So we have agreed as a government, we are not doing away with CBC, but there is going to be tremendous reform. And uh, the situation we are in, it is because the previous administration did not have respect for public participation. They dictated a system without yeah. talking to the stakeholders. They needed to talk to the teachers. They needed to talk to the parents. They needed to talk to the educationists. And now what has happened is that they have been spoken to and they have given their views on how to make this system work. We are waiting for the final report, okay. which will be ready before the end of this month on the various recommendations on how to reform CBC and other reforms in the educational sector, including training, mm -hmm. including universities. You know, we have a big challenge in our universities where they are not able to sustain their activities because of lack of funds from the national treasury. There are various reforms that will be initiated on how we handle our universities. There will be reforms on the TVET sector. Right. So the whole thing, the, the, the presidential working party on educational reforms will come up with a holistic recommendation on how to re-engineer the whole educational sector right. for the purpose of our children and for prosperity, for, for, for ahead, for the years ahead. Okay, and Excellency Deputy President, when we talk about CBC, there is the, the pivotal question of teachers, and uh, we are talking about 100 and 16,000 deficit at the moment in the country. Yes. 
there is the position of the chief administrative position, uh, secretaries in the country. Let's go hypothetical by the number that the former president appointed, 29. You will require two billion to maintain all the CISs who will be appointed, though this uh, is not envisioned in the constitution. Why then not refocus this priority? Because this money can employ 5,714 teachers and also employ the 4,000 unemployed doctors in the country. I mean, talking about in, in the midst of austerity, why do you need the CAS position, for example? Well, to start with, uh, in matters teachers, there is a very big gap the way you have said. In six months, the Ruto administration has done something that has never been done in the history of this country. We have employed 35,000 teachers so that we can start bridging the gap. Next year we'll do another 35,000. We had initially wanted to do it in two years, 116,000. It was in our plan. But on reaching here where we are, and looking at the economy and the performance of the economy, we found that we cannot fill the gap in two years. It needs to be spread across five years. But we have started somewhere. We have now uh, rolled out the employment of 35,000 teachers, and that will really be a big relief to our schools. On the issue of saying that uh, if we don't appoint the CSs, uh, then it can go to the teachers. The same argument, would, why don't you do away with the deputy president so that we can employ the teachers? I don't think that argument will hold. The president, in his wisdom and governance structure, from time to time will determine the levels of support that he requires to govern. We have come from, we have found a country that is in a hole. We are trying to get out of that hole. We have found, like now, the Minister of Agriculture. He's always out of the country. For a good reason. Looking for maize. He was in Morocco, looking for fertilizer. He was in uh, Zambia, looking for this. He was in that. He's hardly in the country. And he's not out there having leisure. Mm. He's working. He needs to leave somebody here to handle other matters that are supposed to be handled by the Minister. Because the PS, the PS is there, okay. he is the accounting officer of the ministry, but at the policy level there is a gap. I was looking for CS Linturi last week. I was going to the uh, agricultural show in uh, Eldoret, and he was not here. He was in some country where the president had sent him. If there was a CAS, that is a person I would have gone to with to the Eldoret show so that he can make whatever policy pronouncements that he needs to make as a minister there. But I had to recall in Turi from wherever he was, he stopped what he was doing to come back so that we go for the show. Because what happens when you go to meet farmers, when you go to meet exhibitors, there are certain issues that will be raised that needs the minister to be there to make an answer. So, from where I sit, listening to the president, assisting him in the management of the affairs of this country, chairing the cabinet committees, there's a gap. There's a serious gap. And we need another level of helpers to enable us execute our mandate. And the president and I and the rest of us are persuaded okay. that the cost, the benefit of having the CSs will outweigh the cost to it, okay. so that we have another level. And you see, even previously, during those years, there was a minister, there was an assistant minister. When the minister is not there, the assistant minister will go to parliament and answer questions. We are reaching a place where we are getting stuck, because you know, as a country, we have agreed that the model of development is PPP, uh, public-private pri partnership. We have a lot of work to do to engage with investors across the world. This means that the cabinet secretaries at their level need to travel to enter into agreements with various countries, with various investors. And what happens when they are not there? There is a gap. So in the next few days, okay. uh, the president will uh, name uh, uh, the CSs. 
And by the way, it's a recommendation by the Public Service Commission. And those people will go to Parliament, they'll be vetted. Then they'll come and add value to the government by assisting the Cabinet Secretaries and by you know, filling that gap where we are getting caught up in situations that are not very neat okay. in terms of service delivery. Thank you. Uh, we Mr. have under 10 minutes to go. And uh, we have uh, a serious issue insofar as uh, our security is concerned. We have woken up to a serious declaration by the CS. Then the announcement that in seven months, 135 Kenyans have died, including 20 security officers. In one week alone, Samburu West, areas of uh, Malaso, Pura, and Kurkur, a dozen killed. Six people killed in Tot Marakwet. At the time, we have a multi-agency operation on the ground. Are we? Is this war winnable or it's just another, for lack of a better word, waste of time and resources? How do you reconcile the fact that we have a very serious operation ongoing and people are dying? And starting tomorrow morning, there are areas that uh, civilians have been ordered to vacate, meaning that it is another humanitarian crisis. What are the measures to <coughs> handle this crisis? And, uh, Yes, did the government think through this humanitarian crisis that will emanate from tomorrow, 8.30? Thank you very much. I, Rigadi Gashagwa, come from a security background. I have, for 15 years, been involved in matter security. I am trained. Uh, I'm a paramilitary officer. I'm trained in weapon handling, in basic combat skills. I understand this topic. President William Ruto has made a decision, and I support him 100%, that this cattle, rustling, and battle menace, and the nonsense around it must come to an end. It's a difficult decision. It has to be done. There is a lot of impunity in the North Rift and other areas that are prone to security challenges. What has happened is that previously, any time an operation is ordered, previous leaders have taken political considerations and stopped the operations. When leaders make noise because of the elections, they stop the operations. So the raiders, the bandits, have been embodied by impunity because they know an operation will be ordered, noise will be made, and it will be stopped. In fact, sometimes they have been sneaking to a neighboring country for a few months, and then they come back. I want to tell the people of Kenya, this operation will go on for one month, six months, one year, two years, three years, five years, whatever it takes until sanity is restored in the North Rift. What has happened is that when we ordered this operation, and the president asked the military to come in to support the IG. And I really want to thank and commend Professor Kithurekindiki for his leadership in this matter. He's a cool guy. Many people had demeaned him because of his size and height. And he doesn't shout too much and doesn't have too much bravado. But he has planned well. I have listened to him. We have listened to the commanders. They have got a good plan. What has happened is that these bandits in Suguta Valley and other gorges are using women and children as a human shield so that they can stop the security officers from carrying out their work. An order has been given. All those areas where the bandits are for people to leave, the women and the children, and they have been given a deadline. Those who don't leave, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They have, they have to leave. These bandits cannot hold the government at ransom anymore. Thank you. We are tired. This matter must be sorted out once and for all. And we are not going to allow criminals and bandits to use women and children as human shield. An ultimatum has been given. We are going to send people with planes and megaphones and ask the women and the children to leave. 
and leave us to face with the bandits. We yes. are willing to have an engagement with them one to one. Thank you. If the bandits want to leave too, they can leave. Okay. But we are asking the bandits to ask their women and children to leave those areas. Thank you. And then we can have one to one engagement. But this government okay. is a government that will sort out that nonsense Sometimes. once and for all. Thank you, Your Excellency. At the best interest of time, we have to leave it there. Many thanks for your hospitality and uh, we thank you for heeding our invitation to talk to the Kenyan people on vast array of issues, of course, uh, because of the ex extensive nature, they can't be done within the time frame allocated always on television, but we appreciate your company and your availability, and we look forward to many more engagements. Asante sana. Thank you very much, uh, uh, lady and gentlemen. And this is not right. <laughs> you are not gender sensitive. Next time you have an interview with me, if you are not gender sensitive, I will not allow you in. Even if you accuse me of uh, not respecting press freedom. I think you guys have been criticizing us. Thank you. For the two-third gender rule. Asante. And here you are practicing uh, <laughs> discrimination. It's but I want to thank you for the interview. Okay. And we respect press freedom. Yes. And we ask you to be objective. Well, that, that is uh, be fair. the assurity okay. that Kenyans are waiting for. Asante Sana, thank you so much. Thank to Nanso Kware, my colleague from the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation, Jesse Rogers from KTN News and Standard Group Limited by extension, Duncan Haimba from Nation Media Group NTV, Dan, that, that is uh, Give Us On Minor from K24 and Media Max, and Eric Monene from TV47 and Radio 47 as well, set for launch tomorrow. And thank you, Your Excellency, for your time and company. Thank you to you too, the Kenyan people, for watching. We aspire to be objective, professional, as we are your avenues for getting information from Kenya and across the world. And we aspire and pledge to hold those in power to account since all power and sovereignty belongs to you, the Kenyan people. Thank you for watching and have a good evening.